This episode of The Lutheran Cartographer is sponsored by Ad Crucem. Get wonderful gifts, Christmas ornaments, art, and cards at adcrucem.com or go to lutherancartographer.com slash 2020 gifts to be taken to their site. The Lutheran Cartographer, episode 48. <music> Lutheran Cartographer, the podcast where we explore what it's like to be Lutheran in different places. I'm your host, Nicholas Weber. Today we are going to Black Hawk, South Dakota, right outside of Rapid City, to talk to Pastor Sturzenbecker of Divine Shepherd Lutheran Church there. Pastor Sturzenbecker, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. So help orient our listeners geographically. We are in Black Hawk near Rapid City. Where exactly is that in South Dakota for those that might not be as familiar with the Dakotas? Well, if you're looking for Black Hawk on a map, it might be hard to find. But know that we are right outside of Rapid City, South Dakota, and that puts us on the western edge of South Dakota. To give you an idea where we are, we are about 50 miles from Wyoming, about 75 miles from Nebraska, and about 150 miles from North Dakota. Uh, Divine Shepherd is right outside of Rapid City. We're actually just outside the city limits, and that would put us about 30 miles from Mount Rushmore, which the western South Dakota, western side of South Dakota is noted for. Okay, so you're right there in the in the Black Hills then, right? Correct, yep. The okay. Black Hills are our back door. All right, good deal. So tell us a little bit more about yourself, your background, and where you've been before you came to Blackhawk. Well, I am a South Dakota native. I grew up here. I have not been out of the state except for three years at seminary in St. Louis, one year of vicarage in our arch enemy, Iowa, and then back to serve uh, three wonderful congregations here. So I started off in eastern South Dakota on a dairy farm. And I learned uh, a lot of great qualities from my dad and my family, work hard and a great ethic and loving people and honesty. And all the way through that, God, uh, he, he continued to pull me into the ministry. And I, I can't say I resisted, but I didn't go real easily either. Uh, through school, did some, uh, I got a degree in diesel mechanics, ran a business there for a while, did some carpentry, made some furniture, all kinds of things, loved everyone. And God just gently shut that door and moved me to the next place to get me ready to go to school to be not a shepherd of sheep anymore, but a shepherd of his sheep. Excellent. So tell us a little bit more about how you'd compare Black Hawk with some of the other places you've been. When we interviewed a pastor out in Brookings in eastern South Dakota, he talked about the difference between East River and West River. Is that something that you've noticed? And what's it been like for you in the comparing Black Hawk to other places you've been? When you talk, when you use those terms, East River, West River, everyone in South Dakota automatically picks up on that. And it's, it, it kind of sets you aside as, you know, where are you going to fit in? East River, our largest city in the state of Sioux Falls, probably about 250,000. And, uh, you know, that's a big community and there is a lot there. East River generally would be probably a little more professional as far as uh, the things that they do, the people that it attracts, because it has more of those professional businesses. Uh, when you get to West River, the atmosphere changes. We have um, probably not even one quarter of the people of the state of South Dakota live West River. So the atmosphere is much more relaxed, much more agricultural in the, in the sense of not farming, but ranching. The climate is different. It's more arid. The ground is not as productive as it is East River. So uh, there is some farming, but it doesn't, uh, it isn't anything like the east side of the state. So what you notice uh, automatically when you come to East River is you notice a, a, a large sense of uh, community East River, uh, a little more business minded, things like that. And when you get West River, there is a huge sense of independence. This ranch style, we're going to make it. We're not going to depend on anyone. We, we've we started this. We're going to finish it. You know, the manifest destiny, all those great qualities that caused our country to push forward. It's really evident West River. Uh, and it also is one of our faults. So independent. 
that we're not going to let anyone tell us how to do things. So independent that, uh, uh, you know, speaking from the church end of things, that these false gods of independence and pride really can crawl up to the point where you have a hard time breaking through that. So there is a there is a huge culture difference. You know, the easiest for a lot of people, East River, a farmer wears a cap. West River, he wears a, a cowboy hat. All right, good deal. I should clarify for our listeners, I realize that not everybody might be familiar. East River and West River, we're talking east and west of the Missouri River, right? In the center, that more or less falls in the center of the state. Yeah, the Missouri River runs almost through the middle of the state, and it... Uh, uh, in the 50s and 60s, when they developed the dams, the river became a great recreational place for all kinds of things. But it is kind of how the how the state divides itself, how it looks at, at uh, its divisions. I see. That makes sense. So now let's go ahead and turn to what you like best about the area. But before I ask that question, I want to make sure to ask you, do you consider Blackhawk as more or less a... A, would you call it a suburb of Rapid City, or is it kind of its own separate thing? Well, here again, here's this West River independence that uh, I don't think that it could be considered a suburb, because Rapid City, for, for most of the people that live here, Rapid City is a place we go, a place you go to work, place you go to buy your groceries, but they love the independence of being independent out here. Blackhawk does not have uh, any kind of city government, we have no city infrastructure. Each housing development where we are has its own water and sewer board and all of those things. So do you see how this independence continues to creep in all over? Certainly. Okay, well then let's go on and ask, what do you like best about being in Blackhawk? Well, there are so many things. First of all, God has called me here to be the pastor of these people, and, and what could be better than to serve the people where God brings you, to bring them the hope and the light of the gospel, to walk with them in their family struggles, to celebrate them and their joys. You know, that first and foremost is the great reason. And then if you are if you are an, an outside person, if you love to be outdoors and doing things, I can't think of a better place on the earth to be than Blackhawk. Right inside the foothills of the Black Hills, we have we have so much to do. There's hiking, there's biking, there's uh, motorcycling, there's hunting of, of so many different species. All of these things, fishing and swimming and, and everything is, clo is relatively close within an hour or two. We have national parks, we have state parks, and just a wonderful, a wonderful place to enjoy the creation that God has given to us. There is um, also, as we live here in Blackhawk, we have so many other great things. You know, the city of Rapid City, while it, it is 70,000 people, which I know for many of your listeners, they're going to think that's just very small. Rapid City is the second largest city in South Dakota. Sioux Falls, the first. Rapid City, the second. And the third, which I'm not even sure what it is, uh, would be smaller, probably not over 25,000. So you can see how, how quickly this, the city sizes change. But for, for, for us, for Rapid City, you know, the services that we need here are here. Uh, we have we've moved up in the world. We have two Walmarts now. Imagine wow. that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of the, the big chain restaurants, the, rest, uh, the fancy restaurants are here as well, along with a host of independent restaurants and different things. Just a great place to be. One of the drawbacks of living here, though, uh, that most people will tell you, and you get accustomed to this, if you're going to live in western South Dakota, you're going to drive. Uh, some of our church members live 100 miles away from the church. So to get to church, it's two and a half hours. And part of it is um, there isn't a, a church where they are or an LCMS church close to where they are. But uh, the common saying is out here, everything in rap everything you need is at least 100 miles. So uh, you, you buy a car, you put a lot of miles on it, you fix it, and you put some more miles on it because you're, you're constantly driving. That's the nature of, of living western South Dakota. That makes sense. So we've talked about the drive time, and we've also talked about the the problems of the kind of dark side of that independence, although it's a very good thing for the most part. You've also touched on some of the, the bad things. Are there any other challenges that our listeners should know about if they're thinking about moving to Blackhawk or to Rapid City? Well, the challenge is, um, uh, the joy again, is we have a full range of four seasons. 
sometimes all in the same day. <laughs> so you have to be ready for the, the somewhat crazy weather that lives here. Now, Rapid City area, they call where we live the banana belt because the weather changes quickly. And it changes, uh, it's not unpredictable today because of the way meteorology works. But as we live here, it was about a month ago on one morning or one afternoon, we had 90 degrees and 36 hours later, we had zero degrees. Wow. So that's that's the kind of thing that can happen here. Now that doesn't happen often, but when you're used to 90 and you wake up and it's zero, that is a big change. Now, just a, a little over a week ago, we had a snowstorm here. And when I got up on Sunday morning to get out of my yard and stepped off my deck, the snow was up to my knees. Today, it was 82 degrees. So there, there are some of the challenges. Wow, 82 degrees today in early November. Yeah. Yes, it. Wow. Uh, I think it broke broke a record from 1942. That that is incredible. All right, so let's now transition and talk about what it's like to be Lutheran in Black Hawk. Western South Dakota was is, was primarily Lutheran or German Lutheran immigrants. Uh, Scandinavian immigrants. So, you know, you would see this historic American Lutheran Church, Lutheran Church of America, the LCMS, you see uh, the Wells Church has a big influence out here. You would see that influence uh, as it settled Western South Dakota. So there is, I was thinking about this today, in people probably in their 50s and 60s, there is still this very strong Christian piety, meaning that they, they respect the church. They know they should be in church. They know, you know, a lot of these gifts that God gives to us, and they, they hold the church as a sacred place, as a holy place. Um, we still struggle with those same things, though, of, you know, the world getting in and not people not wanting to be here as often as they should. And then when you get in now to the younger generations, what we see is this the strong influence of uh, my independence, the strong influence of um, me making my own decisions, not necessarily taking the word of God as truth, but I decide, you know, you can wrap this all up in postmodernism or whatever you want to say. And that, uh, that influences it as well. There are uh, the big, the major religions are probably the dominant ones. Right now, if you would, if you would poll the people of Rapid City, we probably have more Catholics than anything. I think there's seven Catholic churches in town. And then the Lutherans as a whole would probably come next. And that would include, we have a, a large Wisconsin church in Rapid City and a lot of Wisconsin churches north of here. And then a lot of uh, today ELCA, but former ALC and different churches like that. And then a number of uh, LCMS churches too in this area. And then we have Presbyterians and Methodists and, and uh, you know, if you, whatever everyone else has, we have here as well. So, uh, you know, as we see that, being Lutheran here, I think it's an exciting time because what we're seeing at Divine Shepherd is the this, this strong sense of piety that people have. They, they want to be a part of their church and they want their church to be right. But when our churches are turning against the Word of God and doing all of these things driven by emotionalism, driven by postmodernism, driven by a church that won't stand on the Word of God— People are looking for some place where God's word is taught truthfully. A number of years ago, when the ELCA did the whole thing with homosexuality, you know, that rocked the, the Lutheran landscape all over the country, the world, really. And what we had here at Divine Shepherd is we had a lot of people that came to me and basically interviewed me and said, we want to be Lutheran, but we can't stay where we are because that's not what the scripture says. And they really held me to task as far as what do you believe? What do you preach? Why do you believe in this? And it, was, it wasn't hard to have that interview because that's who we are. So as we did that and we have these people coming in, I, I heard comments after that of these people saying, Pastor, I have never heard preaching like that. And what they were hearing is law and gospel. For the first time, they were clearly hearing the law that, that were so broken, and then the gospel of Jesus that just holds us together. So we have seen at Divine Shepherd, we have seen a lot of growth from people who have this, this sense of piety, this Christian piety, old and young. 
who are coming and wanting something solid, and they hear it and they see it in everything we do, in the liturgy, in the hymns, in the, in the preaching, it points them to Jesus and they love it. And that, that's why I say it, it's an exciting time because as everyone else is trying to keep up with culture, we're standing on God's word and his promises and people want that. And when they find it, it's like this, this jewel, that, you know, the diamond that's been buried and now on earth and, and they love it and it's exciting and it's just great to see people gathering around the word of God and finding comfort in that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's such a comforting balm as well to hear God's word preached faithfully. All right, now let's go ahead and talk about what it's like to raise a family there. What What is it like in, in Blackhawk? Uncomplicated. Now, I say that, uh, but I also say that everything that affects every other family affected us when we were raising our kids. You've got a busy schedule, you've got uh, work, and you're trying to meet the kids' needs and take them to all the games and do all the things, and life is just crazy during that time. But there are a number of things that weren't here, that aren't here, uh, the pressure that so many big cities have with all of the, the problems with gangs and different things like that and crime. You know, we have, we have crime here too, but when there, is a, when there is a murder in Rapid City, it'll make the news for a week, one murder, where in some bigger cities, a lot of times they don't even get covered. Uh, raising a family here is, is joyful because we have we have so many gifts of God here you know we have all of this this nature this wonderful outdoors to to engage people in to get their their kids out and to teach them uh, the way that we you know the communities that we live in here I, I don't know if I should actually say this out loud but my bet is that a number of our people still aren't locking their houses on a regular basis and they're still not locking their cars when they go into town uh, maybe black. Maybe if they go into Rapid City, because you know that's the big city. They lock their car there. But uh, many times we have a little gas station just down the street from us. I'll go down there for for whatever I need. And you go down on a winter day, and every car in front is running with the keys in it. That's the area we live in. It's trusting, and it's a uh, it's a, a more relaxed again that that atmosphere. You know, independent, but more relaxed than maybe the eastern side of the state. It has been a great place to raise our kids because uh, they they don't have to fear so many of, of the other things that are present in a lot of other parts of the country, and we're really blessed by that. All right. So now let's go ahead and dive a little bit more into that. What are the educational options for families there in, in Blackhawk? Well, of course, the public school system in Rapid City, and we have uh, we have a great public school system. They work really hard. This South Dakota work ethic, this love for people, it is truly present in our schools as well. Now, the schools are hampered by a lot of things, government regulations, uh, no child left behind. You know, they, they teach in the system that they're in, and that has its own problems. But our teachers, our administration, our schools, they truly love the kids, and they want them to succeed. I have countless stories of students who are struggling, especially now with the with the lockdowns and different things like that, where we're doing this e-learning and these kids are struggling with that and the teachers are working countless hours to try to keep their kids caught up. We, we have that gift. And then as we look into the other parts of education, we have a number of things. We have a, in Rapid City, we have a, a Lutheran school, Zion Lutheran School, which is uh, an elementary school from preschool through fifth grade. And that um, that seems like an odd place to split, but in South Dakota, sixth grade through eighth grade is middle school. So they, they stop there. But what a wonderful school. You know, Lutheran Christian education, truly teaching uh, the, the message of Christ and a great education. And that school is almost always full. There are, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a high school, a Lutheran high school in Rapid City, but there are a number of uh, Luther other schools, other Christian and private schools. We have uh, the Catholics, of course, have elementary through high school. We have um, a non-denominational high school, if you will, Rapid City Christian, and they do, you know, a nice job with that, at least pulling, pulling the kids out of the world, if you will, and helping them to see what Christianity is. Uh, we would, of course probably argue, well, we would argue on, you know, some of the topics of doctrine, but, but it's a different education than a public education. 
And then, uh, you know, all of those things, we have a couple of universities here, really quite well-known universities. We have South Dakota School of Mines and Technology here, which is a tremendous engineering school. And uh, when they get a class graduating, most of the engineers are already uh, working, already hired on for uh, worldwide corporations. So we have that in Rapid City. We have... Uh, uh, used to be the former teacher's college, uh, Black Hill State University. That's in Spearfish, about 30 miles from here. But a, another great quality education school right there. Uh, because of our distance, though, you know, the rest of the schools are East River, so that, that puts people a little bit uh, into a different place there. I see. Let's take a moment for a word from our sponsor. Folks, Advent will be here before we know it, and Christmas will follow shortly thereafter. Ad Cruson wants to help you get ready this season with their wonderful collection of gifts, art, greeting cards, and Christmas ornaments. These things are great. They recently sent me some of their Christmas ornaments. They're pewter. They have a nice weight to them with striking designs on the front. They'll make a great gift for a loved one or a beautiful adornment for your own tree. They have a bunch of different designs. I gave one of their baptism ornaments as a gift recently and I was proud and happy to do so. Ad Crucem also sells greeting cards and Christmas cards, one of my favorite of their offerings. They have just the right art on the front to punctuate the message, which is always robustly Lutheran. No saccharine, overly sweet bromides here. You'll find just the right message for every occasion. Check out their wonderful things at adcrucem.com. That's A-D- C-R-U-C-E-M dot com or go to lutherancartographer.com slash 2020 gifts to be redirected to their website. Check them out. Let's get back to our guest. All right. So now let's go ahead and transition and talk about some of the hidden gems or the not so hidden gems of Rapid City and of Black Hawk. What are some of the activities and restaurants that you'd recommend if you had a friend coming into town? Ah, you got to go check these out. Well, if you like, uh, if you like just local restaurants, we have some great ones. We have a, a restaurant downtown called the Firehouse, and it's uh, locally owned, and it is a firehouse from the 1920s. They retain the the overhead doors where the the fire apparatus and the horses were inside. They've got a lot of the memorabilia inside, so you know you walk in and you do get the sense that you're back in the 1920s. And then they've remodeled the building, and now it's a microbrewery and a winery as well. So they have all of that going on. Great food. It's, uh, you know, it's just one of those unique restaurants. It's not a chain. You're not going to find it anywhere else. And it's great food. That's, that's probably when people come and say, where should we eat? I take them there first. And then uh, just a lot of real local restaurants, maybe not in Rapid City, but uh, there's one uh, about 10 miles outside of town called the Gaslight Saloon in a, a little town called Rockerville that maybe has a dozen people that live there. And just a great place to go into, a nice restaurant, good food, warm atmosphere, uh, live bluegrass music on the weekends of not a professional band, but people who just come and jam together. Places like that. The, the Hills is, is abundant with all these little eateries and, and coffee houses and things like that that are truly unique to the Black Hills. That is really neat. Any activities or things to do that you'd recommend? Well, if you are, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if you love the outdoors, there are um, multiple opportunities. There are hiking trails all the way through the Black Hills. There are places that have this unique character. There's one called the Poet's Table, and it is actually a table and chairs hidden in the spires of the granite of Black Hills that you hike to. And people sit down and they write their work and they leave their work and they, they copy from other people. Uh, just a wonderful place all on its own there where, where people hike to for all kinds of reasons. We have this place where in the 1960s it was called the Hippie Hole, where the hippies went and hung out. It's a uh, just a little swimming hole that's deep, and, uh, you know, the, the waters of the Black Hills run into it and then run back out. But it's pretty well known right now. You do have to hike into it. You can't drive to it. So that's a little hidden. Uh, the Devil's Bathtub is a probably a three-mile hike. 
back and forth across a creek that runs to it. So it's just wonderful in the heart of the hills, just a great place. You can go on a 100 degree day and walk into that and it's 75 degrees because of the shading of the trees and the creek running underneath, just a wonderful spot. Uh, we have the highest point between, from the highest point east of the Rocky Mountains until you get to the Matterhorn is in South Dakota. It's called Black Elk Peak. Uh, it was renamed, politically correctly renamed last year. It used to be called Harney Peak. But it's 7,200 feet. So uh, from there, you can, if you know what you're looking for, you can see five states. And just a wonderful hike up to the top, probably three miles, maybe somewhere in there. And you get up to the top, you can see all of this. You get back to the bottom. Sylvan Lake is there at the bottom. Just a wonderful place of recreation and and Black Hills uh, finery. Right off to the side of that is the Needle Spires. And then if you're a motorcycler like I am, there is a, a road that winds back through there and it's got, um, oh, I don't know how many turns, but each of the tunnels on that road, the Needles Highway, each of the tunnels is built so that when you look through the tunnel, you see Mount Rushmore. So just a wonderful, architectural, amazing thing to, that they put it together that way with that much forethought. So that's there, of course, Mount Rushmore is here, Crazy Horse National Monument is here. We have uh, the Badlands National Monument, which is outside of Rapid City a little ways, but it looks like you're walking on the moon if you've never been there. It looks so desolate, but it's, it's just absolutely beautiful. Custer State Park is an hour south of us, and there are um, antelope and buffalo and prairie dogs and just the wonders of the Dakota uh, frontier, if you will, very much unchanged. Uh, two great caves, Jewel Cave, Wind Cave. Uh, some of the great cavers of the world come here because we have what's called box work in these caves. And that box work is only found here and in a couple other places in the world. So some really unique geological things going on here as well. Thank you for sharing all of that. Let's go ahead now and talk about a topic that is pretty top of mind these days, and that is the the coronavirus. Um, one of the remarkable things about South Dakota was the non-draconian government response. That is one of the reasons why I visited South Dakota was that that more independent approach. How has it been for you guys dealing with the coronavirus and uh, doing worship services in, in these strange times? Well, we've had to learn that together. Uh, all of us, we've had to learn how to handle this. And the wonderful thing, we've talked about it, the wonderful thing about South Dakota is independence. We trust our people, and we have smart people. And our government, especially our governor, has taken that approach. She has been criticized highly by a lot of people for the approach that she's taken of not locking down the state. Now, she has left that up to the businesses. And some businesses, because they're corporate and the corporate hands that down, say you have to have a mask. Other businesses have said uh, we'll open, we'll social distance, but it's always left to the business. It's always left to the individual. The government, especially our governor, she knows her place and she knows what the government should do and where the government is overstepping its bounds. And she has been a faithful proponent protecting us in the midst of this. Now, the, the criticisms that South Dakota received over the last number of months have been high. Uh, if you remember, we have a motorcycle rally here in Sturgis, and that rally uh, this year was expected to bring a million, maybe even a million and a half people. That was before COVID. Uh, it, is, it was the, <coughs> excuse me, the 80th motorcycle rally at Sturgis. And the fear was that if we had the rally, that would just infect the whole world and, and the virus would spread. Well. In our Midwestern understanding of things, they said, we have smart people, wear your mask if you want, social distance if you'd like, we're gonna have the rally. Now, there was a lot of information that went out that said the rally was the root of all evil, but in all reality, when you got back to the really, really good, correct science, the rally did not have that big of an effect on the coronavirus or the coronavirus on the rally. Now, our numbers in South Dakota have been low uh, traditionally all the way through the state. We, our numbers have been low, it's been slow. Uh, our hospitals have not been overrun. In the last couple of weeks, like the rest of the nation, we have seen this peak grow again. And as that peak has grown, our government has not stepped in. 
Our approach has not changed. We have smart people. We tell them to do the same. Wash your hands, cover your mouth. If you're sick, stay home. We leave that up to them. And uh, already today, the numbers were about a third of where they were yesterday. So um, we're not going to stop the virus, but by being smart and letting our people live, it has gained a lot of national attention like you visiting us because of the freedoms. We have a member here that has a, um, they have six cabins that are independent and they have had the best year yet because people are coming to South Dakota to work for a couple of weeks because they're tired of being locked down. So, you know, you see the rest of the nation responding to this freedom and this independence that we have a little bit in that as well. Now, our, our worship that was affected by the coronavirus, like so many, when we originally started and started to hear this, we were in the season of Lent and Easter was soon coming. So uh, we, we talked about it a lot in our leadership. What were we going to do? Were we going to stay open because of our independence? Because we could, were we going to close? And the way that we approached that was guided by our freedoms, our Christian freedoms and the word of God. How do we best serve our neighbor? And because we didn't know what the virus, very early on in March, we, we didn't know much about this. We didn't know what it would do. And it wasn't out of fear that we reacted. It was out of a way to love our neighbor. If closing and not having physical services was a way to love our neighbor and to protect our neighbor from the virus, we agreed that's what we would do. Now we had been online, we had been broadcasting our services for a couple of years already. So that part of it, we didn't have to catch up like so many churches did. We, um, we closed physical worship for six weeks. We live streamed everything. We set up independent uh, times for people to come in uh, in the, uh, privately, if you will, for Holy Communion throughout the week. So uh, for those who were working, there was some evening times. For those who had time in the day, they came in. And that's how we did Holy Week as well, offering those gifts that way. And then the second week of Easter, we opened up again. The restrictions were lightening up. We opened up. Uh, our sanctuary is, is pretty good sized and we have movable chairs. So we moved all the chairs apart and we didn't go as far as many as far as, you know, roping off pews and things like that. We followed the lead that we have so well in South Dakota and we've, we've let our people make the decision. So many the families will sit together, but they'll social distance. And it changed our worship practice just a little bit. We don't use hymnals. We were printing bulletins. The offering plate sat in the back. We didn't pass it. But that, that was really about it. Everything else we continued to do. And thanks be to God. He's faithful. His people are faithful. They're gathering in worship. Uh, the ones that aren't, uh, if they'll let me come into their homes, I take the sacrament to them and we see them. And, and we just continue giving the good gifts of God to his people. Amen. All right. Now, as we start to close out the podcast, I want to make sure to give you the opportunity to point our listeners where you, you would like your church's website, places to follow you online. Where would you like to send our listeners? Well, the best place to go would be our website, divineshep.org, D-I-V-I-N-E-S-H-E-P.org. And you'll find uh, the, the website and everything there. Uh, we have a Facebook page and a lot of our daily quotes and things like that from the scriptures and confessions that goes up there. Divine Shepherd Lutheran Church and School. We have a, an early childhood center in our lower level along with a preschool down there. So uh, that's all in the title there. And you can find a lot of things. We do daily devotions there uh, online on uh, Facebook. They're also on the website. And, and you're going to find the majority of information there. Uh, if you're a podcast listener, uh, we've taken my sermons and they're up on um, on Podbean, sermons by Randy Sturz and Reverend Randy Sturzenbecker. You can find them there as well. Good deal. All right. What are your parting thoughts for our listeners, Pastor Sturzenbecker? The people that are listening, the, the travelers, I find it so interesting to see the different parts of the country and, and what Lutheranism is like there and what life is like there. And I thought about this a lot. You know, what would be the best advice for people? And I think that it, it's simply this. Go to church. Be in the Word. Find that confessional church close to you and be there and let the gifts of God flow over you and forgive you and strengthen you in all that you do. Uh, don't chase after the perfect church because it does not exist on this earth. But find that church and that faithful pastor and be there and be in God's word 
and be joyful at the gifts that God has given to us. Amen. Thank you very much. God's peace. And also with you. Thanks for listening to The Lutheran Cartographer. For more about the things that we talked about today, check out the show notes page at lutherancartographer.com slash 48. I want to remind you about Ad Crucem. Again, they've got great stuff for getting ready for Christmas or general use greeting cards. I love their stuff. Check them out at adcrucem.com or go to lutherancartographer.com slash 2020 gifts to be redirected to their website. If you're not already, subscribe to the show on iTunes or on Stitcher so you don't miss an episode. And while you're there, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave a rating and review. That way more people will hear the podcast. Until next time, I'm Nicholas Weber. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you soon.